Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome our very special guest, Bettina Rahn. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, all of you, for coming on this very stormy, wet night. It's a great privilege to be here. I want to talk about the whole issue of what's happening to men in Australia. And I was thinking about last year, I found myself at a cricket match, at a cricket test, the pink test, which, of course, is, was raising money for breast cancer, breast cancer nurses. Um, and I was just surrounded by this sea of men in pink, pink shirts and silly hats and so on. And of course, it was a great display of men's natural chivalry and kindness towards women. But I was hopping mad. It just made me so cross to see this, um, this audience of men doing, devoting themselves to saving women's lives, to supporting women's cancer at the expense of their own. Uh, and I spent my whole day <laughs> making, doing interviews for my YouTube on why men's lives don't matter. 57% of cancer deaths are male. The risk of dying of cancer before the age of 85 is one in four for males and one in six for females, according to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. So why aren't men out there in blue raising money to save the lives of their fathers and brothers and friends. There were, I talked to two, these two guys, they were very funny, and they said, I said to them, was it fair? You know, do women's lives matter more than men's? Oh, well, that's just the way it is, they said. Um, they were, it was really sweet, and so they said they weren't complaining that week because their wives let them go for one week away together to go to the cricket, so were, there's no way they were going to cause any sort of fuss. Um, but my concern wasn't really about the whole issue of l losing men to cancer. I mean, I know it's, you know, the, the difference is, of course, it's a lot of older men uh, who are more likely to do, die of prostate cancer, whereas some much younger women die of breast cancer. Um, but I've spent years and years and years campaigning about the appalling lack of treatment for men for the, treat the consequences, the sexual consequences of their prostate cancer treatments. I've buttoned my head up against Movember and the Prostate Cancer Foundation, all of which have been totally abysmal when it came, comes to giving money to the whole issue of what the fact that men are absolutely struggling to retain any sort of sexual life after prostate cancer treatments. Um, some years ago, I was at the National Press Club talking about why is it that a breast is worth more than a penis to this rather startled group of <laughs> journalists. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been out there giving talks. I was also once at a... Um, funnily enough, it was, a, it was a ball raising money for prostate cancer support. And I expected there to be a lot of older, older people in the audience, prostate cancer, you know. And of course, it turns out that only gorgeous young things like dressing up in fancy gear. So the whole audience was under 30. <laughs> and these rather startled looking young people found themselves listening to the problems of wilting erections. But I think it probably did them the world of good. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this is just, and what was interesting to me looking at that a very embarrassed audience that night is that I realized it's not just talk of men's nether regions that was embarrassing them. It was talk of men's issues, men's rights. That's what they didn't want to hear about. Uh, we live in a society where women's needs, women's wants are const receiving constant attention. A society which frowns on any discussion of men missing out. Just look what happened to Cassie Jay's movie, The Red Pill. Now, I assume all of you know about that. Well, just in case, I mean, briefly, this is a movie about, a documentary about men's issues. Um, it, in November 2016, we became the first country in the world to try to ban this movie. The first screening was supposed to be in Melbourne and they, the feminists managed to persuade the cinema owner to, to close down that for, for, for intended screening. Um, they hadn't seen the movie, of course, the feminists. They'd simply heard that it was dangerous and promoting violence against women. And, in fact, Cassie J is this love, gorgeous young um, Californian filmmaker. I went to her wedding recently in California, which was very exciting. And she started out wanting to make... She's a good feminist, and she started out 
wanting to make a movie about the men's right movement and attack the, the, the men concerned because she was sure they were misogynist and anti-woman. But after listening to what these men had to say, she decided to focus on the fact that feminism is silencing discussion about really important men's issues. And of course, what happens when it comes to Australia, we find feminists trying to shut down screenings of this movie for month after month. It was a sort of absolute irony, I thought. Uh, but it certainly didn't surprise me. I've been writing about the issues raised in the red pill for over 30 years. Battles in the family court, false abuse accusations, paternity fraud, education pitched to favour girls, unequal health funding, the distorted, distorted debate over family uh, domestic violence. I've been speaking out about the tilting of laws, practices and regulations to advantage, to unfairly advantage women at the expense of men. And I started off as a proud feminist. I was, um, when I was doing my clinical psychology, I just discovered the women's movement. I was very excited about the idea of doing something to help women. And I thought the bedroom was a good place to start, um, teaching women to enjoy their sex lives a little bit better and to get, overcome their embarrassment. And it was just a fantastic area to work in. I was really excited about the new opportunities opening up for women and girls. But even as I celebrated those sort of achievements, I started listening to men. And everywhere I went, men started to talk to me about their sex lives. I remember I was moving house for various reasons quite a lot in those days. And every time I had a bunch of removal of sin, I'd be there for days listening to their sexual problems. Um, and, but I, and it was the most fascinating thing for me to, to start to listen to what it's like to be on the other side of the fence. I remember once I was talking to an audience of men about the problems women have saying no to sex. Now, that isn't nearly as much of a problem these days. We've got very good at that. Um, but back in the 1970s, sex was still seen as part of the wifely duty. And there were a lot of women who were struggling to say no. And I said to this audience of men, tell me about that. Do you ever have trouble saying no? And one young man got up and said, if I ever said no, my penis would beat me to death. <laughs> which is such a sweet story. And of course, it speaks to men's, uh, you know, the urgency of men's sexual desires. And I was learning all about how is life different being a man? And inevitably what happened was, you know, men started to talk to me about sex, but they'd end up telling me about their lives. And I got sucked in to hearing, hearing what was happening to men in the sort of area that Rob's been talking about in, for instance, family law, I started to write a lot about the issues of fathers trying to maintain contact with their children after um, marital separation. And one day I received this surprising letter, just totally out of the blue, a letter from a retiring family court judge. And he said, you're quite right. We've made a huge mistake. We've given too much power to the custodial parent, of course, who was almost always a female. And that power is often abused. And he wrote about, talked to me and talked to me about the fact that you know, women were constantly breaking their contact orders, um, they're moving wherever they like, you know, making false allegations to weaken the man's case and so on. Now, what was fascinating for me is I got very involved, in all, increasingly involved in all this, particularly when John Howard became prime minister. And I think we tend to forget how, what an extraordinary prime minister he was in relation to men and to fathers. Here was a prime minister who at every opportunity spoke out about the importance of fathers in children's lives. And, you know, we just never hear that anymore. And he um, deliberately got me onto a whole lot of committees, um, really to try to even up the balance a little bit because the Femocrats were busily putting men onto those committees who didn't do their, their cause any favours at all. I mean, it was just an incredible thing how they deliberately chose men who weren't going to do do much good for our cause. Um, so I was on all these committees. It was just a fascinating process for me because I just learned how much we we're up against it. Here were these extraordinary groups of professional women, um, really organised, powerful, and they were up against most professional men, most well-educated men fight their individual battles 
battles using highly paid lawyers. They don't get it organised. They don't join groups. And it, I, to me, it was like these... So they wrote these passionate little submissions, and it was like these mozzie... I always thought it was like a, a mosquito throwing themselves against this gigantic mozzie zapper, which was the women's movement. And, you know, we had, they had no hope in hell of being heard. And I also learned that the whole process of these commissions, uh, they're just totally stitched up. Most of the members of the committee don't even see most of the submissions. Uh, they're all the ones that get quoted in any way or chosen by the Femocrats pushing their own agenda. People always write into me saying, why don't you make a submission to this or that, the other? We've got a commission at the moment, law, a New South Wales Law Reform Commission, looking at the rape laws. I was looking at the submissions to that the other day hundreds of submissions from women's groups, all argu arguing for these new enthusiastic consent laws, which absolutely tilt um, due you know, against the due process rights of men. Um, really disastrous changes they're proposing here. And there were mainly ha maybe half a dozen um, submissions arguing the case against the introduction of these laws. Or look at the, the, you know, the Law Reform Commission at the moment into family law. Um, it has 223 mentions of violence in the issues paper that came, that has been issued by the submission, by the commission, and not one word about denial of contact or false allegations or all the issues that many of us are interested in. Um, and it became so obvious to me that one reason why feminists are winning all the battles is the powerful men in our society are reluctant to associate themselves with any sort of group of men, particularly a group of men they may, that may be perceived as losers. And it became particularly obvious once when I was on one of these committees and a very senior bureaucrat took me aside. He said, you know, I never believed the family court system was biased against men. And then he told me about coming home one day and his wife had decided the marriage had ended and she just changed the locks on the house and he tried to get in to get some clothes and he was, you know, police came along, he was locked up. It took him, as you, you totally understand, of course, hundreds of thousands of dollars, years of battling to even see his children and he just couldn't believe it. It's just so tragic to me that Powerful men like him are only willing to see what's going on when they become victims of the whole process. So what Howard did was some, what should have been some real breakthroughs. He introduced this joint presumption of shared parental responsibility um, and a, a child support formula that at least tried to take into account some of the costs of the non-custodial parent. They really wrestled with how to to deal with some of the, these issues. And it should have made a big difference and it began to make a big difference initially. And then of course, what happened was that Howard lost power, Labor came in and everything changed, changed. Now I know this current government has been abysmal on a lot of these issues, uh, but don't kid yourselves that Labor will be any better. Um, I have been writing about these issues and watching the, the political parties and the way they address these issues for so many years and Labor has consistently been totally captured by feminists and by the lone parent groups, the lone mum groups. I was looking at Shorten, some of the Sh Shorten's activity last year. He promised no more budgets for blokes and as he outlined a whole lot of new policies favouring women. He, on International Women's Day, this is what he said. I firmly believe that if Parliament did nothing else in the next couple of years but advance the, the, the march of women through the institutions of power in workplaces, in unpaid work, in family law, in economic equality, if we did nothing else in this country on the whole for the next 15 years but install women to a place of equal treatment in our society, we'd be a richer, more prosperous country with a far better prospect of a brighter future. Now, that's laying it out. He doesn't want equality between men and women. He wants preferential treatment for women. So we, we have this change of government. We have Labor come in. And what, what, of course, really came in with a vengeance is the feminists used the violence card to tilt the balance against men and to argue against a shared care of children because they argued that being exposed to the 
of the violent men was going to be really damaging for children. And it led to an absolute floodgate of false allegations. Um, lawyers everywhere realised this was the way to win um, more power for, to, for the female clients was to make an allegation of violence. And we have seen across the country now men being removed from their homes, being denied contact with their children as a result of a false allegation, and, and laws everywhere being tilted to favour women as feminists gain control over key institutions. Um, of course, your West Australian police minister was quoted saying, we prefer to err on the side of the victim, meaning, of course, she was tilting the laws to enable uh, accusations of violence to be taken into account, even though there was no evidence of violence, and, in fact, to change the laws so that you don't even need any evidence of violence. A, a mere fear of violence is enough for, um, to, to obtain an a, a apprehended violence order and allow women to remove men that they didn't want in their homes. Um, now, interestingly, looking back on my whole career, when I first started really strongly advocating for men, two friends of mine who were very prominent journalists took me out to lunch and they said to me, it wasn't a good idea to be seen as an apologist for men. I should make, write more balanced articles where I presented both sides. And I totally lost it. I said, you're kidding me. The whole cultural dialogue had by that time already been captured by the feminists. There were female, mainly female journalists writing about social issues, presenting the female point of view, very rarely giving more than you know, any attempt at balance to presenting the view of, of males and, and the male perspective on issues. Female editors are acting as gatekeepers. And when male experience clashed with the female's view of the world, the male opinions were silenced. And so I was this lone voice very often presenting it, uh, the male view of issues. And I wasn't going give, give to give, give up half my space to try to get balance when the balance just simply isn't there. But so that sort of, there were just endless examples of it being so obvious to me how rare it was that anyone spoke out on behalf of men. When I did my research on sexual desire. I mean, that's a classic area now um, where we never hear discussion of what it's like for men to live for year after year in marriages where they're being sexually rejected, which is the norm. Um, most, uh, we're seeing across the Western world now a growing desire gap between men and women. As women are being told, if you don't feel like se having sex, you don't have to have it. You can shut up shop. You don't, you know, if you're not interested for the next 20 years, that's fine. It's his problem. And um, so I was once talking on the radio about my research on this gap in design. And I did this wonderful research. It was a fantastic period of my life. I had this brilliant idea of getting couples to keep diaries on how they negotiate sex in their marriages. And I had these 98 couples who kept diaries for up to a year. It was the best time in my life. Um, because they'd, they'd write these diaries in the middle of the night and send them in to me, and I'd leap out of bed every morning to see what happened last night. It was, just, it was a fantastic time. Um, and, of course, what came through was this howl of agony from men. That they ne can, and they'd often never talk to anyone about what that's like to live with a woman you desire and love and not even be able to look at her, um, to be constantly rejected. And, I, and one man was telling me how he sat in the car listening to me on the radio with tears rolling down his cheeks because he'd never heard anyone talk about this. And it's just outrageous that this huge... This, if you ask men what's missing from their lives, there'd be a resounding shout, more sex. I mean, it's absolutely true. Women talk endlessly about what's missing from their marriages and what they're not getting and why men aren't treating them well. And men, this, this issue that is, goes to the heart of what it means to be a male is being totally ignored and they're not even allowed to talk about it. And it makes me so furious. Anyway, I've been basically really lucky because I came into journalism through the sex therapy field. I'd already was reasonably well known. And 
that gave me some extra clout. And I've been able to get articles into newspapers that a lot of other people, and particularly men, would have no hope of doing. Um, so the classic example, for instance, was back in the, I suppose it was the 80s, they were publishing a lot of work on housework, a lot of research on housework. So, you know, who does more around the home? And you'd have these reports every few years showing how lazy and rotten men are and how they don't do anything to help them. Our, us poor women are slaving away, looking up, doing all the work around the house. And what they never talk about is that the research has been really clear for years that men and women do a remarkably similar amount of total work if you add, add paid plus unpaid work. It's almost neck to neck the amount of total work. Australian men average twice as many hours of paid work as women do. And yet, would the reporters ever mention that? No. And the data was there. Even the Australian Bureau of Statistics wouldn't ever highlight that in their reports. They always talked about lazy men and poor, hard-working women. I w there was some wonderful research once showing that Australian women are actually not unhappy, on the average, with the amount of work they do around the home because most women realise that men's long work, much longer working hours, enable them to spend time raising their children. And Australian women have been very sensible about giving that as a priority and, and realise that it's their men's longer working hours that make that possible. But my female editors weren't at all keen on me writing a lot of these stories. <coughs> I once ran into Bruce Baird. Bruce Baird is former politician, the, ma the father of Julia Baird, you may know from the drum, the ABC program, extraordinarily biased program on uh, the drum. Um, he's, Bruce Baird is also the father of Mike Baird, who was Premier of New South Wales for a while. Um, but Julia was my editor on The Herald, and I had this fantastic deal. I was writing for The Herald and The Age, and The Age was giving me a terrific run, and often my opinion pieces would get the center, be the centrepiece, and they were often really promoting me very well. Anyway, Bruce ran into me at some party and said, oh, I love your work, it's just fantastic. And he said, but my daughter hates it, which I knew. <laughs> And he said how he has huge fights with Julia Baird about the fact that, you know, that she didn't, she did, she said to him she did everything she could to bury my work. And that was incredibly obvious to me. And what must have been really annoying to her is that my writing was very popular with readers and not just with men. And it's been really obvious to me that most ordinary women are absolutely fed up with the male bashing that's going on in our society. That... Yep. We have survey after survey showing l less than 30% of people in Australia are willing to call themselves feminists. The only way you get that number anything up to anything like 50% is when you define feminism as equality, achieving equality for men and women. And of course, today's feminism is, feminism is not an interest in that sort of equality at all. So every week I have ordinary women writing to me, mothers of sons, women worried about the men in their lives, or fed up with the fainting couch feminists who are treating women as constantly as victims, always in need of special protection. So last year I had this fantastic letter from a woman just out of the blue, young woman who's a musician. And she wrote this long letter about what's happening in the music industry. I mean, she's really talented, this girl. She's been in the conservatorium in Sydney, the you know, top music school in Australia, since she was a child. Uh, she's won major awards, and she's now living in New York. Um, and she wrote to me saying she got there through a lot of hard work and presumably through a lot of talent. Um, and, but she's always said it, it's been a big advantage to her. She's a gorgeous thing with long red hair. Being a female has really helped her in her career. And she was furious that the music industry is now introducing all these new regulations about women must e achieve equal numbers of prizes and must be on this committee. And, must. and she wrote to me and said, what can I do to help you? And she's now managing all my social media, thank God, you know, tweet, Twitter and all these things I've never been able to face. Um, so I have a whole team of people across Australia 
with all sorts of different talents, helping me fight this good fight to try to do something about what's happening to men. There are many, many women who are absolutely appalled by what's happening with Me Too attacks, uh, where unproven allegations are being used to destroy men's careers. They're fed up with trivial issues being blown up as sexism, and once proud, independent women endlessly demanding special treatment, such as lower entry standards into the police or into the armed forces. Women, mothers write to me about what's happening in schools to boys, where boys are filling the remedial reading classes, they're disengaged, they're dropping out of schools. We had a parliamentary committee some years ago uh, into boys' education. They got a record number of submissions from parents across Australia about this issue. And the government introduced, this was a coalition government, introduced all manner of programs to try to engage more boys um, with a curriculum that had been increasingly oriented towards women. They tried to find ways of interesting boys, uh, uh, catering to boys, special ways of learning. And we led the world at that point in uh, tackling this whole problem of boys' education. But of course, here too, we had a change of government and all the, po the policies that have been introduced under the, under the coalition government were tossed out when Labor came in. And of course, that had the activists celebrating. One of the most extraordinary letters I've ever received starts off at slagging off at my fat poodle face, goes on to commiserate with my daughter for the shame of having such a mother, and then, go, and then concludes... Girls today are far beyond needing equality. They need compensation for 2,000 years of being repressed, mutilated, enslaved, raped, and treated as inferior. That compensation for 2,000 years of all this stuff, that compensation is at the heart, of course, of the domestic violence industry, which is an enormous cash cow for the feminists. Now, how many of you do you know about Erin Pizzi? Some of you, I don't think you do. Erin Pithy is this fantastic woman. She, was the, she started the first women's refuge in London in, back in the 1970s. And interestingly, she found in this refuge all these women coming in, escaping for violence. A lot of the women were violent too. And they were attacking other women, attacking their children. And she started to speak out about this and said... Um, and she knew her mother was violent, as it happened, and she started to talk publicly about the fact that violence is a two-way street, that there were a lot of violent women as well as men. She was absolutely done over by the feminists who were just furious that she... This heroine, this woman who'd started this refuge, was, was speaking out about the true nature of domestic violence. She had death threats. She had to leave England for a while. Her dog was killed. Um, it was, became a very dangerous place for her. And yet she spent the last 40 years speaking out about domestic violence. She, funnily enough, she was coming to Australia in 1976, uh, went via New Zealand, spoke there about the two-way violence issue. And, you know, the, the Australian feminists who had invited her to come and look at the refuges being set up in Australia cancelled her trip here, which is pretty funny. Anyway, Erin Pissy has been speaking about this issue, and of course, she talks about 40 li years of lies about domestic violence and about the fact that back in the early 70s, the women's movement made a big splash and attracted all this support, and then that started to wane, and they seized on domestic violence as the issue that no one can challenge. And it's become this, as she says, an enormous cash cow, raking in an absolute fortune for feminism. And we have this huge industry around Australia um, being poured into presenting a one-sided view of domestic violence. The best thing, of course, is we don't have to listen to Malcolm Turnbull drone on about domestic violence <laughs> being all about respect for women with Lucy whispering in, her, in his ear. Lucy is on, the, is on the board of Our Watch, which is one of these hideous organisations promoting one-sided propaganda, presenting domestic violence as all be, always being about violent men. And I used to know Malcolm Turnbull quite well. I mean, he's not a stupid man. He knows that the research shows what a complex problem this is, that it's linked to 
you know, everything from poverty and mental illness to drug and alcohol abuse. And yet he still feels he'll win women's votes by kowtowing to the feminists. And I think he's wrong. I, I'd be really interested to look at research showing how people are reacting to those sort of campaigns around domestic violence. Because to me, there's every sign that men and women have had enough of all of this. When I was at that pink test, I was talking to this woman who, whose father died of prostate cancer. And she said she was outraged and he would be so upset if he'd saw, seen all the men in pink selling out other men. I think people have had enough of male grandstanding by men in power, and that's increasingly being called out. One of the, the fun videos I made last year was about the Men's Shed organisation. I'm sure you all know about Men's Sheds. Wonderful organisation, really talking to about the fact that men need the opportunity to be with other men, to support each other, and to be in a a situation where they're on their own doing things. I mean, of course, like to talk to each other when they're doing things, and whether it's you know building something in a shed that gives them the opportunity to have conversations they wouldn't have if we, us bossy women, were around, telling them how to behave. So that's how the men's shed movement started, and it's really important, particularly because that those suicide figures that Rob was talking about apply. The, the most at-risk group are the very much older men, who particularly retired men who are on their own and have very little social support. My, so I went out and, much to my horror, the men's shed movement in some places is caving into pressure to allow women into the men's sheds. And that had me spitting chips. And I went out and interviewed lots of men in sheds about what was going on. And I found this fantastic guy who was head chairman of the Men's Shed Association. And he turned out to have a background in working for equity in the workplace. I mean, he, he was a white knight. He was a closet feminist. And he just said to me on video that he didn't believe the male culture had anything special to offer. That, that it was better, as far as he's concerned, to have women there. Um, boy, did he get into trouble when my video was released. <laughs> um, my big campaign this year is to get on campuses uh, to expose the fake rape crisis. And I'm sure you're aware of this, that there's been this campaign for years by the feminists to present our campuses as places that are violent and at put young women at risk of rape. And it's been a really deliberate campaign, presenting misleading statistics, claiming there were all these you know, enormous incidents of rape, and they persuaded the Human Rights Commission to spend a million dollars of taxpayers' money to prove there was a rape crisis on, the, on campus. And what did they come out with? They came out with 99.2% of female students said they in the previous ex two years, had never experienced any type of sexual assault. Not even, you know, a stranger groping them on a train on the way to uni. I mean, even if they include the broadest possible definition. And yet, across Australia, vice chancellors in every university continue to lie and say, we've got this enormous problem with violence on our campuses. I mean, they did have, the biggest problem they came out with was a lot of unwanted staring sexual harassment, the mildest form of sexual harassment, staring, jokes, you know, a few things that some women find offensive. And they beat this up and said, we've got this enormous problem, 24, we have to have 24-hour helplines, we have to have rape crisis units, we have to have sexual consent courses on every... And I wrote to every vice-chancellor in Australia and said, how can you justify this? The data has shown there is no rape crisis on our campuses. How can you present our university campuses as unsafe for young women and put off you know, families in you know, Japan or China or you name it who might be thinking of sending their precious daughters here? You don't say anything funnier than the media units writing these weasel words back to me. Oh, no, no, Den ignoring all the questions I'd put to them. Anyway, now I'm going out there in person. I'm having, I've got student... Um, groups, mainly the liberal, uh, liber liberal clubs on the various campuses have agreed to host my talks and I had my first talk scheduled last month in 
the trove, and they suddenly turned around. The administration, the administration turned around and banned my talk, saying it, can, it didn't align with the values of the university. The values of the university meaning lying about the, the safety of students on our campuses. I mean, isn't that just extraordinary? Anyway, so they banned me, and then we had a lot of to and fro and they agreed to unban me, but said that we, we might be up for a big um, cost for extra security, and then we made a big fuss about that, so they backed off that too. So my talk is start next week uh, on the 6th of September, and then the following week, which is going to be even more interesting, I think, at Sydney Uni. Both universities have already, ha already had demonstrations against me appearing on campus, on the campus. The, the chat lines associated with these um, lib uh, liberal clubs are full of comments from rape victims saying they're going to be damaged by the fact I'm discussing these issues on campuses. Anyway, that's the aim. I want to really expose what's going on here, and I think it's a very good little issue to talk about the really damaging influence of feminism on our culture. Um, and But what's good to me is... I. Th there, there's this sense that things are changing. I mean, here I've got, we've raised $2,000 already um, to cover some of the costs of me travelling around to go to different campuses. And you can donate to my crowdfunder if you'd like to do that, which is on my Facebook page, um, because the students haven't got any money, of course, to cover <laughs> poor things. Uh, and that we don't want to charge students to come to these events. It's really, I want to reach ordinary kids and say, look at what your universities are doing and just tell them a bit more about this whole campaign. The, the campaign about rape on campuses is, has a really dangerous intent. They're trying to get the universities to take over investigation and adjudication of rape cases. And I've already last year been involved in helping a young student, a PhD student at Adelaide University, who was being investigated by a committee uh, following an allegation that he'd been involved in a sexual assault. And I had to get a barrister to, to help him advise him, who said, don't go near the committee, don't go appear before them at all. There was no obligation on him to, go, to, have, to get involved in what was a bundling into a potential criminal case. What are universities doing getting involved with that? Well, I'll tell you what they're doing. It's a feminist campaign to try to get more rape convictions. And they acknowledge that. That's what's happened in America. Obama introduced tribunals, required publicly funded universities to, put, to put, set up tribunals to investigate rape cases. And across America, young men have been thrown out of university uh, using a much lower standard of proof in, when it came to investigating these cases. And they're now suing universities for the fact that their, their, legal, their legal rights weren't protected by the universities. It's got the university system on their knees dealing with the costs of this nonsense. That's what they're trying to do here, and we have to speak out about that. Anyway, my, I'm essentially sort of optimistic. I'm very pleased to hit, find more and more women in particular speaking out about this. Now, do you, some of you will know about Karen Strawn, uh, did you mention, someone Russell mentioned Karen Strawn. Was it you, Russell? Yeah. Um, I first heard about Karen. She's a huge YouTube star. Um, I mean, the YouTube is introducing a whole different conversation around a whole range of issues. I mean, people like Jordan Peterson, uh, they talk about the international, uh, the, sorry, the intellectual dark web. People raising and talking about ideas that don't get a look in, in ma from mainstream media. And it's this really exciting world out there. For those of you who don't know about it, take a look. Because mainstream media is censoring and distorting debate on a whole range of issues that are now be get, be being properly addressed on YouTube, on a whole range of new social media platforms. And one of those people is Karen Strawn, and I first found this little blog she'd written, the most extraordinary blog. She was a divorce mother of three children, getting a divorce from her husband. She wasn't antagonistic to her husband. They just moved apart. She didn't want to destroy him. 
And she wrote this blog about being in that situation and having lawyers and everybody come to her with ways of absolutely destroying that, that part, her partner, um, saying, well, if you do this, you can get more money from him, you could, and presenting her with this armoury that she could use against him. And she wrote uh, this blog saying, what are we doing here? Why are we giving this weapon to angry women to destroy the father of their children? Um, and it was just an amazing blog. She's now a huge star. She's got millions of followers. And she's involved with a group of female men's rights activists, and they call themselves the Honey Badger. And those of you who don't know about Honey Badgers, Honey Badger, there's a... Google Honey Badger, and you'll see this really funny video about this creature. I mean, he's ferocious. Well, I suppose there, there must be women bat honey badgers too. Anyway, they're ferocious animals. There's one where he's, he's digging into a, um, a beehive, and the bees are stinging him, and he just goes on blithely, digging away, trying to get the honey, or he rips off the head off snakes. A ferocious animal. There's a of course, a rugby player who calls himself Honey Badger, who's the star at the moment of The Bachelor. Um, so that's where the honey idea of the Honey Badger comes from, that women across the world now, like me, who used to be feminists, who are saying, enough, we're going to get out there and we're going to take on the feminists. And Karen is probably the best example of that. She's just ferocious and incredibly smart, intelligent, articulate, and she's a formidable person to have on our side. Um, but we need more women, is my feeling, because it's just too hard for men to take on some of these battles because they get ripped apart. And men are constantly saying to me, you can say things that we can't say. And I think that's absolutely true. So I'm really proud to call myself a honey badger and I hope I'm going to be tough enough to keep fighting the good fight. Um, but I... I'm very confident that the potential is there for us to really get lots of people to stand up and be counted. Just look what happened to Trump. I mean, Trump won power because of the support from the deplorables, the white men that Hillary Clinton was sneering about. But also 53% of white women also supported Trump. And they are the women who are watching what's happening to men, who are seeing you know, their, their fathers, their brothers, their male friends being absolutely done over by the system and think that, that the unfair treatment of men is just deplorable. Uh, so there's a mighty troop of honey badgers out there that we can potentially bring on our, our side and I'm out there to recruit them. Thank you.